Welcome to the Events Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Taylor, and each week I talk with event professionals about how they plan, promote, and run their events. We help you build your events empire by growing your business around live events. Whether you're running small meetups or conferences, trade shows, and concerts, we focus on finding actionable tips that you can use straight away. This podcast is sponsored by Events Frame. Check it out over at eventsframe.com. Make the switch from Eventbrite today to our amazing ticketing and registration system with no ticket fees. It integrates with all the major payment gateways such as Stripe, PayPal, and Braintree. And we also have the best email integrations out there, including MailChimp, Zapier, Infusionsoft, Aweber, Drip, and many, many more. You can use our versatile website builder or embed tickets directly in your own site. We've got thousands of live events on EventsFrame, ranging from small community meetups to large trade shows and conferences. EventsFrame is especially good for anyone wanting to run multiple events, as you can host an, un- an unlimited number of events on your EventsFrame account. Most ticketing systems charge you a minimum of 3% of the ticket price, but we just have a flat low fee with no ticket fees and no restrictions. There's genuinely no system out there that is cheaper than EventsFrame. So head on over to eventsframe.com for a free one-month trial. And we also have a special offer just for podcast listeners. Email me at dan at eventsframe.com, D-A-N at eventsframe.com with the subject line podcast, and I'll send you a special discount code. So that's all. Let's get on to the interview. Hi, welcome to the Events Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Taylor. And today's a, a great episode because as you look on iTunes or whatever podcast client, you'll see two hosts, Dan Taylor and James Sayer. And so far, it's only been Dan Taylor. So I'm delighted to welcome my partner in crime, James Sayer, on the podcast, the official second host. (laughs) Hi, Dan. Thanks. Yeah, I've been hiding in the background there. You finally got me onto the microphone. Exactly, exactly. So uh, this episode, James and me is going to have a bit of a chat about how we met and how we started running events together. I think it's it's quite an interesting story. Um, But before we do that, I'll give a bit of background. So I'm, I'm, we're both English, as you can tell. I'm, I'm based in Prague and James is based in Bangkok. What's, I mean, just as a bit of background, what's, what's it like there now? What's it, we're recording this 20th of December, just before Christmas. What's the weather like in Bangkok? What are you up to? Yeah, this is, I mean, this really is the perfect time of year. We're just finishing out the years. I mean, we were just together in Taiwan a couple of weeks ago. It's the end of December. It's basically autumn in Bangkok. It's around about 25 degrees. It couldn't be better. Pool time, it's time to be outside. Bangkok's a great place to be at the time of, this time of year. Normally, you know what it's like in Bangkok. It's 30, 35, 40 degrees, so humid, it's raining. But there are two months a year where it's just beautiful here. And at the end of the year, just looking back on this year, it's a perfect time of year to be in Bangkok. Here, I'm just watching the snow falling down outside my window. It couldn't be more different. It's, it's actually really nice. I mean, if you like the cold, it's a great time to be in Prague. And I, I do like the cold, you know, as you know. I'm into, I like snowboarding and I like... I like it. I don't, I don't mind it, but a lot of people really hate it. There's a ton of people who just want to get out of Prague this time. And I, I mean, so just to give you some background, our office, the Apps Events Events Frame office, is in an, an area called Letna in Prague, which is it's kind of a cool, it's kind of a hipster area nowadays. And I live in a place called Rostocki, which is a village just just outside Prague. And, and even when you go about 15 minutes outside Prague, it gets way colder. It's on a hill. I mean, you like it's literally scraped the ice off your car in the morning at the moment, you know, like warm, you get in the car and it's freezing cold to, to drive in. So it's, well, that sort of weather is great when you're going to do something, when you get to snowboarding or you want to enjoy the winter, it's great for a couple of weeks, but yeah, I'm, I'm over living like that. Even when I was back in England, those gray rainy winters for six months, I was over with that. I want to have two weeks of winter weather and then back to the sun. I got tons of friends, uh, especially kind of a location independent, you know, digital nomad types. They just get out of Prague for the winter. Like, yeah, it's just what you said. If you get into winter sports, it's great. I, I like it socially in terms of like, it's actually a good atmosphere. You walk into a pub and it's like you come in from the cold and it's like, you know, you really, you know, feel like you've earned your drink from walking in the cold, even though you haven't <laughs> like that atmosphere. But um, yeah, so cool. So James, we're going to talk a bit about how we first met, and how we started running events together. Yeah, well, I remember it was a while ago, wasn't it? When we first met, wasn't it? I think it was 2012. It was 2012. Do you want to kick things off? Yeah, so I remember it was back in 2012. I was actually, funny enough, um, working as a teacher in Bangkok at an international school. And there was this, I remember there's this big buzz about a, about a Google event happening in Bangkok. And back in the day, 
that's when Google was fairly new to everybody. There was a huge buzz around the event. I thought this is an awesome opportunity. Got to get myself over to this amazing Google event with all these Google people there. And funny enough, wasn't that your, that turned out to be your second event, your second Google event that you'd organized? Yeah, it was. So what happened was um, I ran my first event in Prague, which was a European one. They'd never been a Google for education. So this is like Google tools for schools, kind of the audiences, teachers, anyone who works for school. Um, they'd never been an event in Europe. So I ended up contacting Google saying, can I run a Google conference? Uh, and I ran it with a friend of mine, John Micton, from the International School of Prague, which has got a beautiful campus. It's like a kind of university campus, really, on the edge of Prague. And we ran this event there, like a two-day conference. We got 150 people. I ran it entirely by myself, which is kind of crazy. Um, obviously, I got, <clears throat> I got friends to come and help with the registration and networking party. But I did all the speakers. I did the sponsors. Uh, you know, ladies of the school. Obviously, John was John from the school played a huge part in helping me. But what happened was, um, it's interesting, like because a bunch of people came to that first event, and the first two or three events, I'm still working with a lot of people now that I met in those events. And I, I think I've said to you before, I think in those early days, I was much more open to meeting people and you know building friendships and business relationships. I, I still do, but in those days, I didn't know anything and I didn't know anyone. So I was just, you know, anyone I met, I was like, great, we're going to work together. And one of those people, there's a few that I'm still working with, actually, Alison, Roland, etc. cetera. But um, one of the guys was a, a guy called Wayne who came across from Bangkok. And he's a very interesting guy, quite eccentric, but a good friend. He's, he did work at the time for the American School of Bangkok. Uh, he's really like an entrepreneurial guy. But I mean, he's like... He started telling me these stories. He had a tea, I think he still does have a tea plantation in Malaysia. He had a social entrepreneurship kind of business in Burma, which was making novelty ties with, uh, I think, homeless people were working there. He had um, some manufacturing facility in, in Tokyo making some ceramic engine parts. I mean, all these stories. And I was like, wow, this guy is just like... I remember he was, he was always carrying a bag of swag around with him, different yeah. things. Yeah, like I mean, I first like I first met him. And I'm like, is he just is he just making is he just a fantasist making this up? And then I met a few people and know him. And was like, no, he really does all these things, you know, and works full time for a school. And uh, so he was like, look, let's do a Bangkok summit. It'd be great, you know. And um, I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, look, I'll get you a ticket to come out to Bangkok. Uh, and literally, um, so he came across. We we hung out at the event, had a few beers. Uh, he came. One of the a Thai guy from his school came with him as well. That one of the IT managers. Um, Om, do you remember Om? Yeah, I do. Remember. Yeah, yeah, network manager. Om came along as well, and uh, and, he, and he, Wayne was really keen. And then I get an email like a week later after the conference, and he's like, "Look, you know, what's your name? What's your date of birth? I'm going to send you a plane ticket." And then he just emailed me a plane ticket to go to Bangkok, and he didn't even properly check I was free on the dates that he bought the ticket for, but he bought me a ticket. And this was like a month later, and I just went out to Bangkok. Uh, and met him, you know, just <laughs> not really any fixed agenda. I, I did a bit, I ended up doing a bit of training for some teachers at his school about using Google. I did a run a whole boot camp, um, but it wasn't fully agreed in advance. <laughs> so I just turned up to Bangkok, and that was when he was like, "Look, let's do it. Let's do a conference. Let's do a Google conference." Sorry, James. Classic. I can hear my voice. I can hear my voice echoing. I don't know what. Oh, it's gone now. Cool. Uh, yeah, it, it was all random, you know, and. I, you know, back at, back then, you know, I had a bit of free time. I was just starting, you know, I just run this Prague business. I, was, I had a small software company, but, you know, I was kind of in a bit of an in-between phase of my life. So I had, I had time and I had flexibility and I wasn't in a relationship. You, you, you only appreciate these parts of your life after, they've, after you have them. At the time, it's like, you know, it's a bit of angst about what am I doing in my life? You know, I need to make money. I need to be in a relationship. But actually, that whole period of my life led to a lot of cool things, you know. It's amazing what you can do with your complete we were just talking about this before when you have just a patch of completely free time where you're not yeah. focused on schedules or busy with meetings what you can do with that time it's true i mean all i really had going on was this conference and and, and i'd run the conference you know so i was like then i was you know and so i went to bangkok met wayne i stayed for a week and i went where did i go i went to phuket actually afterwards i went surfing to kato which is where you, you go there as well i think so I stayed there had a cool yeah, trip yeah. you know the whole thing was just fantastic and we agreed to do an event, and then um, and the second event was was Bangkok. And interestingly, so another guy came to that event, Roland, who's a good friend of ours, and he is from California, but he's really well connected in Arkansas. And he was like, "Let's 
run an event in Arkansas. So my third event was, was Arkansas. Both, you know, Bangkok and Arkansas, both people came to that event. So this is just a general, I guess, people who are starting to run conferences, you know, don't underestimate the serendipity aspect. You know, you might get people to turn up for your event who want to run an event and follow up on that, you know, because it can really lead to events. So just jumping back, between you meeting Wayne in Bangkok and then organizing this, the, the summit, how much time was that to prepare the summit? I think it was three months, something like that, three or four months. It wasn't long. Um, we just started advertising it. Uh, and because there hadn't been a Google event in Bangkok at the time, I think maybe even in Asia, there might have been one or two in Asia, but I'm not, there had been something, there had been. No, 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 no. I think this is pretty much the first. Was I do that? remember that. Yeah, yeah. I want to be careful, I don't, you know, but, but it, well, it was at first or one of the first. So it was really quick and three months is not a lot of time, but Wayne uh, guaranteed a bunch of teachers were going to come from the school, which is a good tip for anyone running an event, even though ours is just a really specific use case in terms of teachers, but if you can get a guaranteed block of tickets sold, which is effectively what we did by having the teachers come, I knew it was going to break even. I didn't and in the end, it actually didn't make a fortune, but I knew it wasn't going to lose money pretty much. I, you know, as long as Wayne paid, <laughs> then I knew we were going to cover the cost of it. And, but it was really because he was so keen, you know, it wasn't, um, he really, he came. I mean, he obviously had a great time at, at, at the summit he came to in Prague, which is a, a key thing. You know, you've always got to give people an amazing experience. But, but yeah, we did it. And um, I remember we had trouble finding speakers, like, because I just didn't, you know, obviously I didn't know who knew anything about Google in Bangkok. So I brought in a few people. I brought in Roland, I think Sarah, Sarah Woods, uh, Ken, Ken Shelton from California. I think I brought in at least four people from the US and, and Europe to speak at the event because I just didn't know any local speakers at the time. So you knew Roland from, was it from Prague, from your yeah, event Yeah, from the Prague? first event, exactly, from the first conference, yeah. Every, everyone what about Ken? Ken, so Ken I met when I attended, I think I've talked about this before, but I attended a, I, I, the reason I got started with the whole Google for Education thing, I attended a conference in California run by Q, you know, computer using educators who used to run the Google Teacher Academy. And they had a Google conference in uh, American town called American Canyon, just north of San Francisco. I, I, I combined it with a holiday, you know, I stayed with a friend of mine who lives there in San Francisco. We, we hung out. I went to this conference. It was great. And I met Ken Shelton there. He was speaking. Uh, and that was how I got the connection with him. And then, so Roland was in Prague. I guess Sarah was in Prague too, wasn't she? Sarah, yeah, Sarah came to the first event. Boy, I'm forgetting someone. I think I paid someone else to come. No, I can't remember. I should look at, I'll look at the website and figure it out. But we ran this event, and I think we had about 150 people came, about the same as Prague. It, it was over 100 for sure. I remember we had the, we, the oh, main... Bangkok. I want to say Bangkok was up to 200 or so. It could have been, because I remember we, the, the main keynote was in... Uh, the hall, you know, which is kind of a basketball court. Actually, slur, slush Dan, one second. I guess a massive truck is passing by outside. It's one fine. Second. I can still hear. No, no, I can hear. Fine. Don't worry. It's not. It's not. It's not um, interfering. Yeah, but I remember that first event was probably. I, I think it was two hundred to two hundred and fifty. Actually, see, this is like I should. You know, it's amazing what you forget when you've run so many events. I mean, I've run several hundred events now, and I really can't remember. I'd have to look at the spreadsheet. But yeah, you might be right. It was big. So yeah, so we we did this event, and um, <laughs> this is kind of an interesting story because. We met, but neither of us really remember it, and you definitely don't remember it. <laughs> meeting. But what, what <laughs> actually happened was I sent you a follow-up email and said, hey, you know, it was after the event. I was in Bangkok. For, I stayed for, in Bangkok for a few days afterwards. And I was like, yeah, let's meet for coffee and catch up. It was good to meet at the event. And you were like, yeah, okay. And then we met for a coffee in, um, in Starbucks. Uh, but, you know... I still can't really remember what we talked about. We obviously talked about something that made me want to meet up again afterwards. Yeah, I think we were just catching up because you were going to go on to meet, wasn't it you were going to go on to meet Lee at, at the, the Bangkok Institution of Cheap Charlies? Yeah, that's true. My, my favorite bar in Bangkok, which isn't there anymore, which is called Cheap Charlies, which is a, it's like it's a roadside, almost like a pop-up bar. I don't know how to describe it. It's got all these crazy wooden sculptures and, yeah and crafted it, out of crafted out carved out of wood basically it's actually moved it's it's oh, has it, it's, it's, is it has it reopened goes. yeah it has reopened a new location oh that's good to know um and it, and it had um you know like a like a, a, a 
train, kids' train it was going around, and it was like, what a weird thing. And just, just stools, but cheap beer. And really, you know, every time I went to Bangkok, I used to go to Cheap Charlie's, and I'd always met two or three people, interesting people, every time I went there. A lot of teachers as well used to go to, a lot of international school teachers. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so we, no, yeah, so we met at Starbucks. And I remember we, just, we were just catching up, and I was in between a, bu- a bunch of things. But I do remember us just talking about, in general, just talking about events. And wasn't it at that stage you were planning on Hong Kong and Vietnam for the year after? Yeah, I was planning, <clears throat> correct, Vietnam, uh, Hong Kong, and what was the next one? That was it, I think. I think that they, they were the two. And, and it was interesting because I think this, I think what happened with us is, you know, you came to speak at an event and then we gradually started cooperating more and more and more until we started partnering on events, I think. And I think we can talk about how that, how that panned out, but I think that's a general, I've done it with a few people and I think it's a generally good tactic for anyone looking. People always ask me, like, should I partner with this person for an event? And my, my advice is always, if you can, just start slow. You know, get someone to speak at an event, get them to see that, you know, get them to help out. Did it, you know, did he really get stuff done? Corporate more and more, maybe give them, maybe, you know, you give them a monthly retainer, then maybe you start paying them and maybe you start partnering with them. I think it's just good to do it in stages if you can, because people can act really, really keen. And this has happened to us loads of times. People really act keen. And I want to work with you guys. I want to do this, I want to do this. And then nothing happens, you know, or they kind of, they do help, but not, they miss things, you know, it's not, they don't have a big picture. And it's, so you, you never know until you start working with someone. Do you know what I mean? Comple- yeah, completely. And I see that even now is that lots of people want to get involved. But I think it, it, they, they want to be involved in the event at the front of the event, meeting people, networking and so on. But all of the stuff in the background, I think is a surprise to everybody how much, is, how much extra work in the background there really is. Yeah, definitely. So... Now, from what I remember, you, I first of all got you to come to an event. Just, I don't think I paid you. I think I just gave you, paid your expenses and you came and presented a few sessions. Is that right? Yeah, I've got a feeling that was Vietnam, I think. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if, if Vietnam was 2013, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what it was. Yeah. Either I presented in Bangkok, it was a year after that or something like that. And yeah, and you said, hey, here's a flight, here's a, here's a hotel ticket, hotel room, come across. Yeah, an interesting side story about Vietnam is I um the night I got there two days early and I was running and it was like monsoon rains. I was running across and it was next to this shopping center and I slipped and I, I whacked my head against this glass the glass wall of this shopping center, cut my head really seriously. Called my friend at the school. He got me. In, I went to the hospital. I had to get stitches, um, and then they gave me some dodgy Vietnamese medicine. And then the next day, the first day of the conference, I had this allergic reaction to the, to the, the medicine. And I was like, I was scratching myself. I was like, oh, no. So I had to go. And you ended up taking over running a lot of it. Yeah, I remember you. I, I remember you walking down the corridor. <laughs> you were you're looking a little bit pale, pale, paler than you normally do, which is a miracle. Yeah. And sweating. And you, you definitely did not look too good. And you talked about the medication you were on. It was clear you having a uh, reaction to it. Yeah, I'm just so. thinking back then, actually, I just pulled up, funny enough, I just pulled up a list of speakers from there. So Gary Johnston, he was one of the speakers at that event. And he was at Saigon South in Vietnam. Yep. And he subsequently moved to Korea. And he's presented for us, actually, across Asia and uh, in the Middle East as well. So just talking about getting people involved, it's funny how, like, just that initial meeting with somebody really strike, strikes a bond. And it's funny how far they go from that. But yeah, from that initial event, yeah, you, you came down a little bit sick and I took over a couple of your sessions. But I think that, um, I, I guess that helped you out a little bit. Yeah, definitely did. And um, so that, that was really it, I think. I mean, and, and just sort of the progression of things, I mean, you've, I guess, how many, so, so these conferences, which we call summits, at this point, how many have you been involved in, would you say? It's got to be 20 plus, 30 plus, maybe even. Yeah, I'm going to say for the summits, maybe 30 to 40 plus the boot camps. Yeah. A different, yeah, different levels. I mean, if you include that Vietnam one from speaking, yeah, easily, easily thirty to forty summits now. Easily. What, what was the tr- what was the transition from you speaking at events to you starting to organize it? I'm trying to even remember it myself now because at this point, well, I should say, know, fa- fast forward to today. James runs Asia for Apps events. We're partners. He, you know, he's an Asia director. So, I'm just trying to work out the stages where we how we got to that level. <laughs> I should know this, you know. I, I try to figure this out as well. But you always hear people. Hear people people talking about, oh, you get lucky to get in that position. 
but actually hard work brings about luck. It brings about opportunity. And I remember at the Vietnam event specifically, Sarah, so Sarah Wood, she was managing the registrations for your event in Vietnam. And so I partnered up with her and she kind of got me on the desk and telling me how to welcome people. And I just basically saw all of the, the um, sort of behind the scenes, what you need to do. And I just got stuck into it, got down yeah. to it. And I think from there, from that initial thing, from speaking at the Vietnam event and then also getting involved in running it, it just kind of, I think it just progressed naturally from there. Yeah, it's funny. I gave a talk at this, um, you know, DC, which were members of this entrepreneurs group. They had a proud conference and I gave a talk about how to run events and make money from events. And uh, I, told, I told people like one of the main best ways to get involved in your first event is find an existing event and offer to help with registration because you, know, you can never underestimate how much help people need for these events. And if you're a keen, helpful person, then you know it, it's always a great thing to have. And registration is the best thing to do because you get to meet every attendee. You get, it, it teaches you so much about how you have to interact with people. Uh, but people remember you, you know, you're the guy in registration, everyone remembers you. And, and so you, you, you build, it's a good way to build contacts, just generally helping out with registration. I recommend it to everyone. Yeah, it is. And it's amazing because you, you're standing on registration and suddenly you're the point of co- contact for everybody coming into the event. And you never know. And within those attendees, you've got, obviously got huge range of, in our case, teachers from different schools, from di- different areas, different countries, different regions. But obviously, you have IT directors, you have principals coming in. It is a great opportunity for people to get involved in. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I um, <clears throat> that's always a thing, you know. I, I think generally, event there's a boom in, in number of people running, running events now, you know. And I think a lot of people want to do it. Uh, I would say, you know, before you run your own event, if you get a chance to help out with somebody else's event, you will learn a ton about running it. I'm just really thinking about this now, to be honest. I've never really said this before. And I think getting involved in someone else's event is a great way to learn about how to run an event. Um, there's so much to think about, you know, because on the face of it, running, running a conference is really simple. You know, it's, it's, you sell tickets, you find a venue, you organize a networking party, you try to get some sponsors, uh, you find some speakers. You know, that's, the elements are not complicated. But there's a lot of nuance you know, the, going from that to running an amazing event that people want to come back to is really, really hard, you know. Yeah, I think you're, you're going to give up one of the biggest secrets of success to running the, the education summits because we host our events in schools. Yeah. And I, I still believe schools are the perfect place to host an event. Definitely. Well, I think, you know, like, I mean, getting into like, if you, to run an event, you've got to minimize your downside. You know, what is minimize the risk of how much money you could lose? Like the number one rule is don't lose money. Yeah, there's a good chance you won't make any money on your first event, but you've got to try to do everything not to lose money. And if you book a hotel conference facility, you know, it's going to, there's kind of a general rule. Most places in the world, it'll roughly cost you $50 per person per day, you know, for the room and lunch. It could be a lot more than that. It could be less, but you know, that's a good guideline for most countries, you know? So hundred person conference, that's, you know, 5,000 straight away, you know, 10,000 if it's a two-day conference, you know. That's a lot of money to make. So if you can find uh, a free venue, then obviously you've mitigated that risk. And, and a second huge benefit is they can partner on the event. So our example is schools. We run an event because we're education and we love to partner with schools. Uh, and they help us promote the event. It, it's a, it, it genuinely is a joint event in our case. It's not, you know, we're running the event with, with them. But there's other examples. Like you can run an event with a co-working space and maybe if it's an entrepreneurial type event, they'll want to promote it to their network as well, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I, the, the angle I was thinking of about the hosting in the school, a school is a running event hosting business on a daily basis. They're hosting classes of students every true, day. True. Students walking around from room to room. They have technology in every room. You have announcements. You have screens set up. Wi-Fi is permanently on. You don't need to load test anything. The school is a ready-to-go conference hosting that's a good point. I've never really thought venue. about it like that. Yeah, it's true. I mean, yeah, load testing. Just because think of how many times, even in a hotel, how many times a Wi-Fi will go down and you think they will be ready. But a school, yeah, they're really set up for multi-device usage. Yeah, and so when you, so just going back to that, so when you organized, you had the first two in Bangkok, when did you start to feel that this was actually going to be a business for you rather than organizing a Prague event, a Bangkok event, and then, then one in the U.S.? When did you start to feel it was actually going to take over as a business? Oh, I, I wanted to make it a business after the, f- the first event. As soon as I did the first event, I had such a good time. I'm like, this is great. You know, I made some money because my costs were low. I didn't have any employees then. You know, it was just me. 
So as you know, we had, we had a, a software system at the time, Course Director, which we, we were selling in the process of selling to, to some Danish guys, whiz kids, great guys. I, you know, like I told, said in the beginning, I was kind of in an in-between phase of my life, you know. And so right after that first event, I was like, I want to run more of these, uh, you know. I, that, that was, I straight away, I think even before the event, I was like, this could be a business, you know. And as soon as I'd done it, I was like, I'm doing more events, great. So, you know, anyone who came to me, like I was saying, the guy from Bangkok, Wayne, and the guy from Arkansas, Roland, anyone who expressed any interest, I was like, yes, we're going to do an event, perfect, you know, let's, let's agree it. Uh, and I think, you know, I, more things came from that first event. I mean, Sarah, I, I ended up going to to her school and she worked in Kiev in Ukraine. And I went there myself and just gave a, gave a training session on, on uh, you know, how to become a certified trainer. There was someone that came, and I mean, there was a bunch of small things from that event. There was someone who came from El Salvador, amazingly, British School of El Salvador. And I went across to El Salvador and <laughs> trained them on, I mean, this is just me flying out and, and, and training them. You know, it wasn't like a conference or anything. It was a training session. Um, and actually, this is reminding me now, when I think about it, like, that, you know, maybe when you've run a lot of events like we have, we're not as prone to be jumping on these opportunities because there's probably just as many opportunities now people come into these events that we could be, like, jumping on like I did in these early days. Like, let's do an event, you know? It's, uh, even though, I mean, there was, there was a lot. There wasn't, you know, we, we had first mover advantage, I, I guess. In there wasn't many Google events at the time. But, but still, I think, you know, now it's a good message to keep, to keep remind yourself that there's always opportunities people that come to your events that you could run w events with, you know? Yeah, definitely. And also, of course, I think that we're, we're recognizing this. Events need to follow this path of evolution, I think, to stay relevant. Cool. Yeah, talk about that. So whereas I topic. think some events, say it again? Yeah, yeah, expand on that because that's a really interesting topic about, the, you know, how you yeah, keep so an event just, relevant. I'm just thinking because, yeah, we're thinking about this as we, as we develop and innovate on what we have. Some events stay the same. And if that event keeps repeating itself exactly the same, that's an opportunity for somebody else to jump in and do something slightly different and then run with that. Yeah. I think there's always opportunity for events, especially smaller ones. Focused events, there's always an opportunity for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we found that, you know, we've maybe made the mistake a couple of times of running a too similar event the year after. And, and that usually leads to a drop-off in numbers. But if you, if you innovate and you put in a whole new theme... Um, you know, even a new location, it's not even just the content, just being in a new place and things, I think gives it a kickstart as well. Yeah, no, I mean, every new location has a new audience. True. So let's get back to the story. So what was the next stage after you, you presented? I think it was just a case of you coming to more and more events and presenting and wanting to get involved in, in running the events. Yeah, I think so. I must have presented at the event in Bangkok in order for you to invite me to Vietnam. So it's amazing, we Vietnam even, amazing that, I don't even remember any of this. We were like, did, did, did we present? Yeah. But I, I think before Vietnam, we'd already begun to be friends. I think we met up a few times. We'd already, we were already hanging out a bit. And then, so yeah, Vietnam. And then I think the year of Vietnam, we had three events pretty much in a month. I think we had Bangkok, Vietnam, and Hong Kong as well. You remember in Hong Kong, we, had the, uh, we were doing an educator's boot camp, and we had 50 people in one big wide room. Do you remember that one? That's true. Yeah, it was in the. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was a huge room, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. I so if that. I look at it back now, like just looking at myself. So back now, back then, I I ran the registrations with Sarah, and then I ran the boot camp in in uh, Hong Kong. I attended Bangkok again. I think just from there, probably you know another twelve months after that, we started talking about me running more events, more training, and just yeah. getting a little bit more involved. I'm just trying to think. When we sort of did the handoff from you man managing the event to me, I can't even think. I think it may have been Korea. It was a gradual thing, I think. And then at one point we said, look, you can just run these events yourself, you know. You don't need me there. Yeah. And um, yeah, and again, just to come back to it, I think the lesson of this, which is, I think, an important lesson for people partnering with events, is just work with someone. You know, you don't need to do every, agree everything up front. You know, you don't have to say, right, we're going to partner. You know, if you can work... If you can do it gradually, it definitely leads to a deeper relationship, and at least in you knowing for sure that someone can do can do what they say they're going to do. You know. Yeah, for me it was very much it was pretty natural as well. I wasn't rushing to you weren't rushing to find somebody to work with. I wasn't rushing to work with you on the. There was no pressure on either side. It was a very natural thing, I think. Yeah, and I guess the next evolution was Middle East. Really, we started running your favorite region to run events, given the travel, given your travel from Asia. But, but we started <laughs> so doing overnight events. Overnight flights, yeah. 
we started doing events in the Middle East together, which we, that was a growth from because because just to, to grow up by at this point, we did Bangkok, we did Hong Kong, we did Vietnam, and then we we kind of exploded. We we've done several events in Korea, several events in in all those countries I've listed. We did Singapore, we did uh, Malaysia, we did Cambodia, Philippines. Cambodia, Philippines several times. Basically, almost everywhere in Asia apart from. Japan, Indonesia, and, and China, I guess, are the only places we, we haven't really done events in Asia and Burma. Yeah. And so, yeah, Middle East, how did that come about? I don't know where the initial contact came from, but I remember um, the two guys at the school there were just super, super helpful. I think you had the contact. Actually, I've I just, think I've just remembered it. No, can I just tell you something? I just can't believe I forgot this. Yeah. The, so the, we ran the event in Qatar, was the first event we ran, and they also came to the first Prague Summit. <laughs> I just remembered. I didn't, it was a long, it was a long, because it didn't happen straight away. It happened like three years later, you know? But the, I met those guys also in the first ever event I did, the Qatar guys, and we, and we, and we kept in touch, we kept in touch, and that, that, that's what led to the, to the event in Qatar. Yeah, so one of the Craig, I think he's in Estonia now. Is I think he, he hosted an event actually yeah, last yeah, year did. or this yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in Latvia, in Riga. Latvia, okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think by then, I think I had the bag of signs, a <laughs> crazy hockey bag or softball bag that we wheel around everywhere with a bag of signs and badges and lanyards and all of that stuff. Took it into to Qatar and set up the event. It was. Yeah, and that's that's a good. That, that's, I mean, looking back at it now, it's pretty crazy. That's there wasn't beha- much communication of how we're going to do this before I got there. It wasn't, and you had to get visas and things, and there's all sorts of restrictions. And that's this kind of behind the scenes thing. Of it. I mean, like a lot of running events. Anyone, anyone who lists, who runs events is nodding ahead. This, but it's it, a lot of non non glamorous things. A lot of it is you've literally got a big bag with all you've got your 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 roll up signs. You've got your backdrops. You've got a whole bunch of other stuff, name badges, and you've just got a huge bag. You're looking around and setting everything up. Uh, for the event, you know, and that's what, but still now, you know, for Asia, we've got a couple of bags of just full of stuff that you have to lug around to every event or sometimes get it couriered depending on the event. Uh, and that was it. You, you, you just turned up there with your hockey bag and, and set everything up. Yeah, it is funny. Yeah, she's thinking about those bags. When you go to these big conferences and you get the senior VPs of these companies representing themselves at these events, you don't realize they're carrying their bags as well. They've all got these wheel bags with their signs in. I think it's pretty funny. This whole yeah. business of people carrying their signs around the world. It's funny, you know, because we, we, we've, uh, we've exhibited at conferences as well. It's just what you say, you know, you, you turn up at an event and you see all these cool booths of all the signs, but, you know, if you meet those guys at the setup, there's literally a sort of sweating executive with a couple of huge cases exactly. t- turning up <laughs> with these signs, you know? And, I, and that's one of those things, actually. Like, it's a good point that... You know, you can't be a prima donna like a lot of... We've worked with people who, like... And, and especially with small events, right? We've worked with people who just want to be a keynote speaker and want to be the superstar. But, like, the people you really want to work with are the guys that come and help you set up the signs, the guys that help you with registration, you know? The people that... I mean, and that's a tip for any, anyone who's speaking at events. Just get involved with everything because, like, you would do anything to get those people back. If you know, A presenter who helps you out is, is, like, 10 times better than someone who just presents, you know? Absolutely. And even a keynote speaker that helps you out even more so because you never know when you need a backup speaker. There's always, you know, at a big event, you're always going to get a speaker sick or they have a family emergency or something. There's a reason why a speaker can't be there. And then you're scrambling the night before at midnight trying to fill the schedule. And that person who's offered to help you out, they're your superstar. Definitely. That's that. Yeah, exactly right. So Middle East, we, we did Qatar. I, I didn't go, actually. I've never been to the Qatar summit. <laughs> Interesting. I, do, I did once. Oh, something else always came up. It has been, it has been noted, Dan. It has been noted. <laughs> has been. And, and then we did Dubai. We did an event in Dubai. What else in the Middle East? I think that was it. Because uh, Oman, we ran an, uh, an Oman uh, book. We've done Oman. We did an Abu Dhabi, which is yeah. one, of the, one of the Emirates. That's true. And I think we'd love to do more in the Middle East as well. That's a huge potential I think for us, uh, those countries as well, Saudi Arabia as well. We'd, we've had a lot of discussions with Saudi Arabia about doing an event as well. Yeah, and so back to Asia. I mean, in terms of what the future for our events is like, what we're talking about now is really trying to build a flagship event, which we're thinking about making in Bangkok. Bangkok's our most established event, as I've said. It's it's now 2018. We started 2012, so seven years we've done this event, uh, and we really want to grow this. Like, we want to do a flagship regional. Event. So this is like, 
you know, this is a learning experience for us. I mean, you know, we, it's not like we have all the answers. Like we're now transitioning from running a bunch of smaller conferences in Asia, which we're still going to do, and we're going to run these events, but to also doing kind of a one or two kind of flagship events. So it's kind of an exciting time for us working on how do we broaden the event? How do we have a theme of the event? How do we get more sponsors? It's kind of a, it's a good sort of growth stage for us to go through. It is. And it's something that you keep bringing up. I don't really notice because I live in Bangkok. But as you keep saying, people love to come to Bangkok for events. Yeah. And I've asked around, I've, you know, I asked people like Tim from Hong Kong. I've asked people in Singapore and they're all like, yeah, Bangkok is like, that's the fun place to go for a weekend if you live in Asia. Um, you know, I mean, obviously Singapore and Hong <laughs> We're Kong. We're just asking all our friends where we should go in Asia and everybody says Bangkok. <laughs> exactly. and all that maybe that's just, just our yeah. friends maybe. But like, yeah. but also... Um, <laughs> You know, Singapore and Hong Kong are, are, are the biggest convention sort of centers, uh, but they're also expensive, you know. So with Bangkok, you know, a couple of things. Hotels, I've never been to a major city that has as good value hotels as Bangkok. I mean, you can stay in a five-star hotel for $150 a night. Now, that's still a lot of money to a lot of people, but trust me, like you pay f $600 to stay in the same hotel in Prague, which is not an expensive city, you know. And... So Bangkok is great for that, and it's 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 relatively cheap for for flight. But a lot of budget airlines fly there, and there's good, um, good food and drink options as well. I mean, you know, which are pretty cheap. So I think I think it's a good place to really run an annual event. And, and I think there's there are there's a bunch of obviously there's lots of conferences in Bangkok, but I don't think it's got the recognition like Hong Kong as as a kind of big conference and exhibition location. Yeah, I don't know about that. I think yes and no. I think Hong Kong and Singapore, they have the established big conventions in the region. Yep. But Bangkok, the the meeting, the what is it called? The mice business in Bangkok is huge. And part of it, I've got to say, part of it is this. When you go into some countries, when you're organizing an event, you're carrying your conference bag with you, you've got your signs in there. Quite often, the immigration is asking, what is your purpose of visiting? And you do have to be a little bit careful what you're saying when you're visiting a country to put on an event. It's true. There's a bit of a gray area as to whether you're working in the country or not. Whereas in Bangkok, there's no questions at immigration whatsoever when people are coming into Bangkok. There's industrial, there's massive industrial events because obviously Thailand is a big manufacturing base. Yep. So they have these true. big industrial events every week and nobody is asking questions about people coming in or going out. If you want to work here full time, it's very different. You need to have all of your paperwork. But I think for the events business, I think it's wide open for people to come in organize events well yeah that, an inter interesting side point there's a bunch of digital nomad types in thailand existing in a huge gray area i mean you just, just go to chiang mai i mean the city is full of them and they basically i think it is every three months they have, they cross the border to, to do a visa run to go to cambodia or something and come back again and um there's a crazy number of people and i think thailand's kind of to this point turned a bit of a blind eye to it and said well they're you know they're spending money here like you know but I'm sure that's going to change at some point. Yeah, I think that we see the digital nomad being a big, big community, but it's probably smaller than we imagine. It's true. It's just we know some of those people. But yeah, you're right. It's probably not that, not that big. I mean, in Thailand, I think in Thailand, there's probably one or two million migrant workers from the surrounding countries coming in. Yeah. That's digital good. nomad population, maybe a couple of thousand. That's a good point. You just notice it more because they're, they're online all the time talking about their digital nomad <laughs> All in the life. coffee shops, yeah, <laughs> with their MacBooks. <laughs> We've seen it. Yeah, it's true. Cool. Well, look, I think that's a good place, good time to wrap it up. It's good. It's good to sort of document a bit about, you know, a story of how we started running events together in Asia um, before we forget it all. So hopefully there's a few interesting things in here for people. So cheers, James. Anything to say in closing? Yeah, cheers, Dan. So I think it'd be good. We can continue this conversation with our, with our next project next time. Yeah, good. We've got a lot more to talk about, but this is a good time to wrap it up. So cheers. Do you want to sell more tickets to your amazing events? Events Frame Event Ticketing has been built to minimize the amount of time it takes to buy a ticket. Result, you sell more tickets. Check out eventsframe.com 